I traveled all the way to the Arctic Ocean to show you this iceberg because it's going to tell you everything you need to know about culture for AP Human Geography Unit 3. And that reminds me, where do polar bears keep their money? In a snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> and the jokes only get better from here, folks. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, first, as is our custom, let's begin with a definition. When we talk about culture, we mean the shared practices, technologies, behaviors, and attitudes passed down by a society over time. So for example, let's consider my culture here in America. Although to be fair, the United States is home to many different cultures. Even so, there are some aspects of culture that many Americans embrace. Our shared practices include celebrating Independence Day on July 4th, where we blow up millions of dollars of gunpowder and cook meat on the grill, just like the founders would have wanted. One of our most beloved technologies is the car, which means our landscape is dominated by roads and bridges. In terms of behaviors, Americans sure do love going to sports stadiums where we take off our shirts and paint our bodies with bright colors and crush $10 hot dogs. And then in terms of attitudes, most Americans are highly independent and individualistic as opposed to many Eastern cultures that emphasize a person's role in the community. That's where this iceberg is a helpful illustration. See, above the water, you've got the tip of the iceberg, which your eyes can see. And in terms of culture, that includes everything that's obvious about a society, like their language and their clothing and their behavior, the way they use their land, etc. But then below the water is everything you cannot easily observe about a culture, like a group's patterns of thought or cultural norms. And let me just give you one example, namely how different cultures view time. Here in America, we say time is money. Therefore, it is considered the height of rudeness to be late for a meeting. But in Brazil, for example, appointment times are a lot squishier. I mean, if someone is half an hour late to a meeting, then eh, it's all right. So at the tip of the iceberg, all we can see is that Americans and Brazilians show up to meetings at different times. But the tip of the iceberg doesn't tell you why this difference exists. And for that, we need to go below the water. Now, here we see that Americans with our ridiculously wealthy economy conceive of time mainly as the medium in which we make money. But Brazilians value social interactions and relationships more than Americans. And so those attitudes below the surface help explain the differences we can observe above the surface. Oh, and by the way, whether you're an American or a Brazilian or wherever you are from, if you want to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's got whole unit review videos that you won't find here on YouTube, note guides to follow along, practice questions, practice exams, and answer keys for all of it. So, you know, if that's something you're into, check it out. Okay, now everything we can observe about a culture is up here above the water, and that's what we call cultural traits, and that tells us a lot about a culture. And oh, it's getting so cold, let's throw it back to Heimler in the studio. Now, there are many cultural traits in any society, but there are three traits that you need to know. First, we have food preferences. There's an old saying that goes, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you what you are. And if that's true, then my middle school self basically amounted to a bacon cheeseburger and a box of fudge wraps. But more to the point, each culture has distinct food preferences. For example, much of the food in Singapore is heavily influenced by Southern Chinese food, and that's because a huge portion of their population is of Southern Chinese heritage. And as these two cultures join themselves through intermarriage over the course of history, a distinct dish known as nanya has become a marker of that cultural heritage. And what does that taste like? Well, nanya business. <laughs> <laughs> Second, architecture is another important cultural trait on the tip of the iceberg. For example, the homes in many suburbs across America look relatively the same, which is an indication of a national aspect of American culture. But the architecture in some regions is a reflection of more local tastes like adobe homes in the American Southwest. They make use of local clay and other building materials, which means to see them is to see the materials of the local landscape and culture. Third, cultural traits are evident in land use in a society. In every place around the world, people use the land to survive and build their lives. And because the land has different features in different places, those land use patterns tell us a lot about a culture. For example, land in France is often seen in this pattern known as long lot settlements. One edge of the lot borders some kind of important natural resource like a river or a road. But what's interesting is that you also see this distinctive land use pattern in parts of Canada and the northern United States. And why is that? Well, because during the age of European imperialism, the French controlled all these areas and brought their cultural land use patterns with them. So that particular way of organizing land tells us a great deal about this culture's history. Now here's where I tell you that cultural traits can be organized into three different categories. Artifacts are the visible parts of culture, which includes everything we just mentioned, like food and language and land use. Sociofacts are structures that influence a people's social interactions, like family structures, governments, or religious organizations. Both of those live up here on the tip of the iceberg. But then you've got mint effects, which include a culture's shared ideas and values, and those live down here in the icy depths. <laughs> is that a bear? Is that a bear? All right, I'm out. Okay, now the last thing we need to talk about in terms of culture is attitudes towards cultural differences. Now, even with the forces of globalization, which has led to the increasing rise of a global pop culture, most cultures are distinct from one another. And so we have two terms to describe the attitudes that people have towards those cultural differences. First is cultural relativism, which is an evaluation of a culture by that culture's own standards. In other words, cultural relativists look at cultures different from theirs and embrace them because they understand that cultures arise from distinct beliefs just as their own culture does. So how can they judge negatively another's culture when they 
to our culture bound. So in this case, an American goes to Brazil for an appointment and the Brazilian is 30 minutes late to the meeting. So if that American is a cultural relativist, she might initially be annoyed by the tardiness, but will come around and say, you know, his lateness is a good thing because he just values relationships so much more than I do. And you know, I'm gonna hug him when he gets here. But on the other side, we have ethnocentrism, which is the evaluation of a culture by the evaluator's cultural standards. In other words, ethnocentrists look at the cultural differences and judge them good or bad based on their own cultural assumptions. That guy is late for our meeting and that makes him and his culture dumb and so I'm gonna punch him when he gets here. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for unit three and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. Thanks for coming around and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.